So, um, slides. Here it comes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to do some octet singing um, <laughs> and jumping around. Great. Um, if we want to make radical change, if we want to do things that are pretty significant and impactful, um, today I'm going to suggest that actually in order to do that, we need designers, and we need a lot of designers. Not just me, not just IDEO, not just design practice. We need designers everywhere. Um, we need so many, in fact, that I'm suggesting that rather than go out and try to find them, we make them. And so today I'm going to suggest some ways that you in the audience can actually become and think like a designer. Um, before we start that, though, I want to ask a question. What do we think is good design? Can somebody give me examples of what are great design in the world out there? <laughs> I stacked the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's the third. Everyone knows. Um, uh, yes, uh, 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 Apple's a really great example of phenomenal design, and I want to talk a little bit about why we think it's a great place to look to for design. It's not because um, their objects are pretty and round and monochromatic. That's certainly one thing that we like about it. Actually, by the way, I have to say, I was really inspired by the lecture before me and then the first lecture of the day, and I learned one thing, which was, Always put cute animals in your presentation. Um, so that's my iPad with my dog at home, and I'm here instead of with my iPad and my dog. So it's... <laughs> um, but Apple has this incredible job at have, making incredible impact through the design work that they do. This was actually right outside this uh, uh, lecture hall this morning as somebody unveiled their own iPad. They were so excited, and people were taking pictures of people taking pictures of people <laughs> taking pictures of the iPad. Um, that's how exciting it is. We don't think that Apple is a great design firm because they make great products. We actually believe that Apple's a great design firm because what they do is they make things that act different. They do things differently than normal things, and they actually make us act different. If anyone's been in an Apple store, it's a great example of it. This is an Apple store in New York during lunchtime, and when you walk through the store, people are not buying products. People are surfing the internet. They're picking each other up. They're uh, having lunch. They're doing everything but. An Apple store is more like Central Park on a good day than it is like a store. Um, they make things that act different. I'm going to give you another example just from my own experience. Um, I know it's, you sh maybe you're not supposed to talk about Toyota now, but I still think that um, uh, the Prius is a phenomenal example of great design thinking. Um, and it's, again, not because it looks like an iPad on wheels. It's actually for another reason. Um, it's because of this. When they created the, um, the, the Prius, they didn't have to put a screen in the dashboard. They didn't have to engage you as a consumer into what it meant to think about how you were actually consuming fuel, but they did. What they did is they put a system in that allowed you to continually see the way your um, uh, interaction with the machine was affecting your fuel usage. Um, a pretty profound and simple thing, but you know what? It changed the way people drive. Anyone who's been around Priuses and Prius drivers knows that they are not watching watching the road, they're watching that screen. Um, I actually, um, I, li I live in Los Angeles and I live in a canyon, which is all Priuses, and in the morning you hear the, the, the sound of nothingness as all the Priuses leave the canyon. And um, you know that you do not walk your dog within a certain time because everyone's looking at that screen and driving these quiet cars and you're basically, it's like a, it's a death trap. Um, so, what I'm saying here, though, is that good design will actually not just act different, but it will make us act different. And when we're talking about big change, which is what we're talking about today, we need things that help us act differently. Um, so that's great. Um, if we're thinking about what great design is, we have a beginning of an idea of it. But what about good designers? And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience around kind of what I thought good design was. I was trained, I might, got my master's degree at, in architecture here at Berkeley, and um, came in with an idea that design was about helping people. I don't know where I got that idea, but that was kind of the foundation of what I thought design was about. And spent a lot of time getting trained to think that, in fact, Design and designers were a very special breed, that they acted different than the rest of the world, they were different, they meant something different, and they needed to be respected differently than the rest of the world. Um, there was a great quote earlier that was from Anne Rand. Anne Rand really messed up the profession of design in my perspective, because basically she suggested that, yeah, designers are great men who do great things, and they do it independently and in the world alone. Um, that's wrong from my perspective. Um, 
about two years into working at IDEO, I had the luck of going to work at IDEO, um, I worked with a hospital. Um, we were going to do a kind of healthcare project design, redesign, and went into the hospital con um, context. And one of the things that you see when you go into any kind of healthcare context is that basically hospitals are littered with the, it's basically an archaeology of great design ideas that never got adopted. You walk through the hallways and it's like, we thought we'd do the room this way and it, no, nobody ever adopted it. Or the doctors didn't like this so nobody ever used this. Um, and it began to suggest that actually if you really wanted to think about how design really engaged with people in healthcare, you had to bring the healthcare people into the process. We had to bring nurses and doctors into the design process. And so we did that. We actually led a series of design sessions using nurses and doctors to actually generate design solutions. Um, the idea being that the, the solutions they developed, they'd be more likely to respond to. Um, so I learned a really interesting thing while doing that, which was that nurses are really good designers, far better, frankly, than a lot of the people that we brought into the room. And the reason they're good designers is because basically everything is against them. The world has been designed against them. They have to undesign all the things that we put into the system. Um, and they're doing it all the time. They're working around the system and designing things. And so it began to suggest to me, and, and, and I think a lot of us at IDEO, that in fact, design thinking was something that was embedded in all of us. It's just about kind of awakening it and kind of getting those things um, out into the forefront of our mind. So what I'm going to do today um, for the rest of my nine minutes and 43 seconds is talk to you about three designers. And um, they're designers who you may not expect, um, but I want to talk to you about the practice that they have and the ways they think about design and how they're making really significant change in the world using design thinking. Um, and by the way, few of them would think of them potentially themselves as designers. Um, the first person I want to talk to you about is Julie Gilbert. I don't know if anyone knows her, but she actually used to be an executive at Best Buy. And she, um, she was charged with the task of thinking about how to better market to women um, at Best Buy, basically figuring out how to kind of get women consumers engaged with shopping at Best Buy. And one of the things she actually began to realize about the company as she started to think about how she would do that is that Best Buy was really great at benchmarking the best practices in the world. They would actually send people all over the world, executives, in a private jet to kind of look at the amazing things that were happening, come back, and then from that kind of like looking out and benchmarking, give a great new strategy um, about what, what Best Buy should be doing. One of the first things she recognized was that when those planes took off and traveled the world and looked at all the things, there were no, no women on those planes. In fact, it was all men. All the executives were men. And so the first thing she said is, you want to make a women's focused strategy for Best Buy? Get a woman on that plane. Um, and a very simple thing was basically saying, from doing that, getting women involved in the conversation, we were going to fundamentally change the way Best Buy could act. And they, she did that. She created a system called Wolf Packs, which are collections of women that actually design for women. So the first principle that I think we learned from this is that if you want to be a good designer, you should know the constraints within which you're designing from. The way I think about this is people always come to us and say, um, we got to bust out of the box. And I'm saying, do you know what the box is? And I think Julie Gilbert was a great example of someone who said, wait, first let's understand what the box is and design for that, and then let's think about what we design. The second designer I want to talk about, um, maybe the only one in the group who would consider himself a designer, is a, a guy named Antanas Makas. And he actually, about in 2004, uh, became the mayor of Bogota, Colombia. And um, when he took over Bogota, it was actually in serious shape. There were water shortages, um, pollution issues, um, massive issues with traffic fatalities, um, significant. And he basically started to go about using the city as a design platform to rethink the processes and systems in the most creative way he could, basically busting out of um, old, ma old methods of doing things. Um, my favorite story is that he came in, as I said, traffic fatalities were incredibly high. Um, and he did what anyone would do. He basically allowed the meter maids, the people who actually walked around and gave tickets on the street, to kind of issue really expensive tickets so that people were having charged a lot of money if they jaywalked, jaywalked or drove differently or um, uh, drove up on the sidewalk or whatever they did. Um, and um, it wasn't working. And so at some point, he sat with a group of people and he said, this isn't working. We're not touching what really matters to the citizens of Bogota. Um, what really matters? And somebody said, well, you know, and the reality is, um, for Colombians, we care more about humiliation and our pride than we actually care about paying a big fee. And he was like, great. 
And what they did is they replaced all the meter maids, all the kind of uh, the, the people, with mimes. So that's actually what you have here. <laughs> is a mime, um, and what he's, you know, he's leaping out in front of this massive truck um, with the incorrecto sign, um, <laughs> and humiliating people. And guess what? That doesn't just work in Colombia. That would work here, right? Um, so within a very short period of time, um, traffic fatalities in the city had dropped by half. Very short period of time. So <laughs> it was such a successful program that the mimes, in fact, began to teach regular police officers and people who were in the street how to use mime techniques even in their policing. <laughs> this is not a city we want to go to. Um, but, <laughs> but to me, this is a really phenomenal example of one of the core things that we as designers need to be doing all the time, and that is be empathic. Think seriously about the ways that we feel and the ways that people around us might feel and use that as a point of inspiration for the ways that we design. This should be the easiest thing for us to do. We're all people. We should be able to empathize with other people easily. Ironically, however, it's often sometimes the most difficult thing to do. It's the thing that's the hardest for us to remember to do. So the one thing I would like you to, to ask you to do as you go out today is think about how you can be most empathic as you're kind of solving the problems that you solve. The last example I'm going to use is a doctor. He's a kind of hipster Brooklyn doctor, if you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> it's a, uh, Dr. J. Parkinson's, he, yeah, he, he knows he's hip. But um, anyway, but he um, did a phenomenal thing, really phenomenal. He came in to the kind of profession and basically said, I don't want to act like doctors acted before. He's like, I don't want to necessarily set up an exam room the way doctors have always done it. I don't want to navigate healthcare. I think it's hard to navigate. And so he created a really simple structure. He basically put his Google Calendar up on, open to the web, let people make appointments through his calendar himself. He would go do house calls, so there was no exam room, and they would pay him through PayPal. So in one simple, no, three simple steps, he basically built a whole new system that allowed people to bypass healthcare entirely. Bypass it. I know, right? Actually, I was, I was just in D.C. and I was talking to Health and Human Services and I was using this example because I think it's such a great example of exactly this, of just saying, wait a second, we let's just break the system when we need to. He, so that he did this, this pretty phenomenal thing. He, within, I think, a month, he had 300 patients, more than he could handle. He became like the kind of toast of New York. He ended up getting venture funding and created a system at a portal called Hello Health, which is basically a new portal that allows doctors to build this kind of system quite easily. Um, so a very simple thing, um, very, um, and basically where he said, I, I want to challenge the precedents. I want to break through the way people do things in the past. But what I think is fascinating here is that what he did was a prototype. He basically tested something. It might not have worked, but he put it out there and he let people respond to it directly. And this is the third thing that I actually think you as designers should be thinking about. Try it. Put it out there. Prototype it. Test it. And here's the good news. What he did, I don't know how to go back on this thing, but what he did was actually um, really easy, but it was systemic. He could prototype a whole new system with very simple tools. We can do that now. Technology allows us to try whole new ways of doing things quite quickly and test it. And if it fails, it fails. But if it succeeds, you might be uh, the next hipster doctor. So, um, <laughs> so try it, prototype. So I thought I'd leave you with some thoughts about um, you as designers, um, because it's easy to sort of see uh, design thinking as it's out in the world and say, oh, yes, you know, I can, um, uh, they can do it, but I can't do it. Um, but I actually really do believe that um, really everything is a design problem. Every moment that you're faced with is a design problem, and you're always having to think like a designer, you might not just realize. Um, so today, as I was like coming in, we were like looking at how you think about how you communicate to people when you're not around. There was a, there was a parking pass issue. There weren't enough of them. And I saw all these people who parked who were TEDx speakers who wrote TEDx Berkeley. They were trying to communicate in all these different ways. How we're communicating, this was a really great Easter egg hunt sign that was basically like, how do we go to this direction? How are we reforming our environment constantly to make it easier for us to kind of sit and convene with people. At watching lunchtime, people were reshifting their spaces, reshifting the way they use things in order to make it better for the conversations that they needed to have. Um, the reality is we're designing all the time. We're just not thinking about it. And what I'm asking you to do today, this was actually on University Avenue. This, is, this guy to totally thought about it, um, obviously. It's like... <laughs> 
But what I'm asking you to do today is take a moment and when you're out there, recognize that in fact the things you're being faced with are design challenges. Everyone designs. And that in fact you can bring design methodologies, some of the things we talked about today, to the things that you're dealing with. So um, like I said, we need designers. Um, I hope you guys sign up to help. Thanks. <laughs>